So welcome to my session, Creating School Culture That Fosters STEM for All. My name is Melissa Collins. I'm a second grade teacher in Memphis, Tennessee at John P. Freeman Optional School. I truly believe in STEM education, higher order thinking, and teacher leadership. So here's a quote I want you to look at for a minute. STEM is not a class you teach. It's a culture you build. Love him. Yes, he is awesome. So when you read this quote, what comes to your mind? Does it just pop out? What? Absolutely. Anyone else? Fam yes. Yes. Absolutely. So there's a lot of things that go into building a STEM culture. And it's not only just in your school, but it needs to be in the classrooms as well. So we gotta make that magic happen there first. So we can have more students like Junior Scientist Brightland. So if you would, with your partner, turn and talk, what is the current STEM or STEAM culture of your school? So I'm gonna give you a minute. Give you time to talk. If you hear my voice clap one time, hear my voice clap two times. So would anyone like to share, what is your current STEM or STEM culture right now? Dream big. You dream big and then you make it happen. Take them steps. Anybody else want to share? We have a couple of comments from the virtual chat. Um, one says that they exist in the bubble of the STEM room or lab. And another, we don't have time for STEM is the overarching feeling of the school. Mm. Okay. Hopefully after this session I make a change of mind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's important that everybody see that they can play a role, even your non-STEM teachers, and that it's a cross-curricular approach. So, several years, I hear you online. <laughs> I am very uh, passionate about STEM, and I was doing it a lot in my classroom. And I wanted it to kind of get a ripple effect throughout my school building. So what I did, along with some other teachers across the country, we host some focus groups in our buildings, and we ask teachers, um, what do you think it takes to be a rock star STEM teacher? And 
Heather Brighton here. She was in one of those groups. And I was like, be honest, okay? So here are some of those characteristics that they felt that teachers need to have. So focus on building a classroom culture and positive relationship with students. We know relationships are very important. Encourage academic risk-taking, inspire curiosity and inquiry, promote failure, collaborate with colleagues and organizations. Okay, I'm using my other one. And expose students to real world connection content and be willing to rock the boat. Be in, be in a, do something different for your kids and for yourself. So, and we'll just popcorn this out. So what are some characteristics that you think students should have in the classroom? So we looked at teacher characteristics. What about students' characteristics? Take risk, yes. Very good. Accept it, respect it, yes. Um, right, be able to ask questions find the answer to those questions, because sometimes we think it's about the answers, but actually it's power in those questions. Making noise, yes. Because if you're doing all the talking and going home tired, you did too much work. It needs to be on the kids. <laughs> Application, they need to go home tired, right? <laughs> so here are a couple of characteristics that I've noticed that kids need to have. As we prepare, as one, someone said, for the 21st century, because we know we need deep thinking, those soft skills need to come through, and of course we want to work with that social emotional piece. And I thought about that as we enter COVID 2020. It definitely needs to be a balance. And when they go in the workplace, you need to see it's okay to share your emotions and know when you need to break, but you also need to have fun as well as you enter the STEM workforce. So I'm gonna give you a, a minute just to look over that. And then two, when we think about STEM identity, and I think I guess Speaker talked a little bit about that, where he really didn't see himself in that space. But he had people come along. He created a habit where he could see himself as a STEM person, a person who was passionate or love STEM. So did anything pop out? And some of you said some of these things. And I like that adaptability. We can think about that with COVID, we had to definitely adapt and adjust. So how can you develop these characteristics in students and teachers? So do we have any principles here? Okay, would you like to share how, maybe how you can develop those characteristics in teachers where they're not afraid to try, they have a safe space to explore STEM? It's definitely a connection if you do STEM. So many things go within STEM teaching. And mistakes <laughs> are like things that you make and you just can erase it with a pencil and start all over again. And so I think it's important that teachers know that they can be reflective practitioners, they can make mistakes because if they continue to do it, they're gonna get it right for kids. Yes. Okay, Did you, who wants to share about how we can develop those characteristics in students.
sometimes you got to let him do it. I remember I was doing my presidential award video, and I was doing what effect does the height of uh, the ramp have on the distance the car, tour car would travel. And one of my kids wanted to test the pencil. And back in the day, I would have, ooh, I would say, girl, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, okay, I taught her. So I said, what are you trying to test here? And it was just the two of us. She said, I want to see how far this pencil is going to travel. I said, what do you think? She said, well, I think it's going to travel a far distance because the ramp is high. I said, okay, everybody get back. <laughs> Scientist Sierra is getting ready to test this pencil. And it worked. I said, oh, and she felt really empowered. And so sometimes we have to let go and just let them do the work and guide us. So I love this statement, and I truly believe in it. Exposure brings about experience, not only for the students, but for the teachers as well. We need exposure to stand what does that look like, what are our expectations to get them ready for the workforce, and our students need to also have exposure so that they can see the opportunities, the possibilities, see themselves as STEM professionals. So here are some of the characteristics. How can you develop that? And teachers, principals, we can look at this in the same way. STEM mentors. I have a STEM mentor. I have a medical doctor, Dr. West, who helps me with my STEM program. I didn't go to school to be a scientist. I went truly to be a teacher. That was my calling. However, I realized that it wasn't a lot of STEM professionals out there that looked like me. And so I wanted to empower that into my students. And so what better way to do that is to reach out to somebody in the field and let them be your mentor. Because to me, everyone needs a mentor, and mentorship never ends. Professional development. We have some principals in here. We need good professional development. And teachers, you can self-regulate and go attend some good professional development that supports your students and yourself. Field experience. Go visit Amazon, Ford. If they won't let you come into that building because of COVID, you can do some things virtually. They even have things on their website that teachers can visit. And later on, I'm going to share with you some different resources or connections that you can make to get those STEM professionals in your building. Professional learning communities. I know teachers, sometimes we don't like them, but good PLCs are needed. You need time to talk to your colleagues. Share your stories. Come with a purpose. A purpose. Observing other rock star teachers. Being able to take constructive feedback. And principals being able to give good feedback. And opportunities for this safe space, which we talked about. So how do we create that in the classroom? And we talked about a lot of, of these things already. And we talked about student identity, getting the habits where they fall in love with STEM, doing those things. But I also believe that it's important that they see professionals that look just like them. So they see that they're STEM capable. They have the right tools to be that doctor, that engineer, uh, my kids have talked to so many different people. Um, so no students as learners, who they are, talk to them. Sometimes it just takes a one-minute conversation. How you feeling today? Bad. Why you feeling bad? My house caught on fire. Okay. Or what did you do last night? I used Legos to create a robot, and this actually happened. Okay, I'm going to get your... Uh, Mom, dad, to send me what you created. Okay, and then it's important to establish routines and procedures. The song that I open up with you all, I sing that every STEM lesson, so they know it's science time. 
when we move, I believe I'm an athlete, and I believe in a well or machine. And set a high expectations. And this is even with equity. You give them what they need, but you keep their bar high. They will get there. And through STEM, I notice even my test scores going up because of it. And really appreciate those diverse voices, giving them a time for student agency. A lot of people say, hey, any, even the families, oh, it's not about them, it's about the teachers or the principals. No, your student voices and family voices are very important in this work. So how can you do that for your school? And these are some things that I actually help implement as a uh, STEM coordinator, STEM lead at my school, implement different STEM programs. So we have the Future Leaders of STEM, FLS, that started in 2019, I'm proud of. Invite experts, whether it be in virtual or in-house, um, Project-based learning for everyone. STEM Expo, bringing in nothing but STEM professionals to share with kids. And seeking out those partnerships, we have a lot of partnerships. I can be in a doctor's office, <laughs> and I'm starting that partnership. I'm like, hey, I need you to come talk to my kids. Um, we already talked about the mentor. Apply for grants, there are different grants. Uh, TVA, Voya has grants. We started a STEM advisory board just to get more voices in. We have students, family members, um, the industrial partners join us on that advisory board. And when they hear where we're trying to go, ooh, that money start raining and those different <laughs> people start helping us with the work. Because you want, when you want something, you got to make people feel a part of it. You have to make those relationships and let them know what's going on and develop a mission statement. So from that focus group, I said, mm, we have a school mission statement, but we don't have a STEM mission statement. Maybe that'll help. And so we developed that. And what can those STEM partners offer? Field trips. Before COVID happened, we was going to Henry Ford in Dearborn, um, no, in Michigan, right. And so, Steve Cohen had given money. I Facebooked him. Hey, can you help me out? <laughs> he sent his own personal money, uh, Congressman Cohen. We I called churches. They end up giving. So we was trying. We was gonna take these kids here to write on a free trip. Um, classroom visits. They can come in and visit. They can lead inquiry based activities. If you let them know what's going on. They do not mind uh, helping enhancing those experience for the students. It can even happen virtually. I'm a jack of all trades. I'm like, hey, what you can do? Mail it to me, what we need. So whatever, I just think you need to be innovative. Just think outside of the box, it can happen. And um, we already talked about some of those things. So what does that culture look like in our school? Because I really believe Seeing is believing. So here's our mission statement that we formed through uh, the decision-making process. So you can look at that now. And our students and families know our STEM mission statement. So does anything pop out? Mm -hmm. How many of you have a STEM mission statement? Yes, it's addition to our school mission statement. And then here are our beliefs. OK, 
right, and we talked about some of these paths earlier, but you can just get an idea of what that looked like. So even though we have this club for a selected number of members, we truly believe STEM is for all, and so everybody gets to experience STEM. And here's me with my babies in their lab coats. <laughs> And they love singing, so we think about different ways to sing songs and chants where they learn about STEM. They get their chance to engage in inquiry-based activities. They have lab sheets that they work on so they can feel like scientists. They get the tools that they need. They get to sometimes create their own uh, investigation, and I help guide them in their work. And if you notice, they have a label here. Because, you know, sometimes it can get out of control. And like I told you, I like to feel like a team and have control of their classroom, even though I let them explore. So they won't argue and really get to develop those soft skills. I let them assign roles. I choose the leader, but I let them decide who's going to be the manager, the recorder, the reporter. And so they use a clip, clothespin clip, and they clip it on their lab coats. And so they wear their lab coats. Um, during their science experiments, and then they wear them when they Skype with a scientist or they meet with an expert. And with the future leaders of STEM, they rock their lab coats too all day. <laughs> and, um, and it just empowers them. And you'll hear students say, I am a scientist. And that's what I want. That's what we should want as professionals. And they get an opportunity to present, and people, they can present to their peers. We set up things in our classroom, invite people in. We did the African American Vendor Museum. They would set up like an exhibit, dressed like the professional, passing out candy, flyers. <laughs> they loved it. I was like, come, come here, you need to talk to me. <laughs> so they were excited. And so I've even done um, the Busy Bee Arcade, where we put on black and yellow like bees, <laughs> and uh, had set up a store, and the kids were invited in to play their games. And so we just make this a part of their culture. And then all the money was given to St. Jude. And that's where you start breaking already, where he created an animal that could hold a spoonful of seeds. And it took him several times. <laughs> but I told him, go back, try again. I'm not going to show you what to do. You show me. And here are my babies where I bring in those co-presenters. And, uh, and here you can invite a STEM professional. Skype with the scientists is very good with inviting those professionals for free. And those professionals already are familiar with what to do. You can ask them whatever you want. Let them know what you're teaching your kids. If you want them to do something hands-on where they can conduct those virtual lab experience. Uh, we have a journal where students can write their questions, and then once they're finished, they can reflect over that professional. So when it's over, at the end, we just had our vision plan party, where I'm not telling them what I want them to do, but at the end, they're invited to write a plan with their families, what they want to be when they grow up, and sometimes they come up with some of these professionals they make, make how they're going to get there, uh, give me a famous quote from someone, and then I have the parents and the students sign it, put it in a frame. I put on my cap and gown. I surprise them with my cap and gown when they come in the room. And I said, this is what I aspire you to wear and earn. So that means as you go on through school, that you focus on earning your cap and gown and hopefully becoming one of those professionals. But sometimes you may change your mind, and that's OK. And then the networking star, because if I get a good <laughs> Still professional, I keep up with them. And this, he was really cool. This was Sharif. He'd been on BET, Time Magazine, and I found him on Skype with a scientist. And so that was awesome. And so here's just a example of a schedule of how a teacher uh, can conduct a classroom visit.
And also, I'm working with uh, the National Teacher of the Year in Voya, and it will actually be a book that's coming out for teachers. And here are some other places that teachers can go, or even in your school, you can have a school-wide virtual uh, STEM panel, and we'll talk about that later, how we did that at John P. Freeman. And the Google Computer Science and Night Experience, they do that like around December. Uh, Amazon Future Engineer, you can go on there anytime, and they can schedule that. Connect to a national uh, park, ranger. I had a book, I think it's CLIS, I don't, I don't know where my book ended up going. But uh, Women in Science and Engineer is WISE. This was Texas A&M. You can go to their website and request, and they'll do whatever you need. And the last one, Edutainment Learning, you can go on there, and they do live streaming. So with me, as I talked early and joked about talking to doctors on doctor visits, I end up going um, on a global fellowship to the NEA Foundation. And while I was there on that trip in Brazil, I just started collecting instruments because I was thinking about what could I do, what could experience I could bring back in the culture to my classroom. And so I used it during a physical, physical science activity where they learn how to produce sound and students create instruments out of recyclable items. And so I share those instruments. I, from other countries, it gave me a chance to bring the world to them. I asked them what actions they can take, strum it, beat it, shake it, beat it. They get to explore with them. Then they create their own. So at first, it was the lesson was sound all around, which is posted on Better Lesson. But then I decided during the pandemic, how can we get families in other countries involved in this experience? So I got with some global leaders and develop one band, one sound. And I just got, and this is just giving you an idea of how they could use that link that I put out there in social media. And on Earth Day, countries, kids from all over played their instruments, becoming one band, making one sound. And I end up Skyping with Michael Dunley class in New Jersey, an all white class, because I believe in uh, diversity. And so his kids, and you can see mine's one virtual, we played with his class, and it was really cool. And so here's an example of what we did in our school. Uh, we wanted to do a STEM fest, and we normally do that, but we, with COVID, we weren't in the building. So we did a virtual STEM fest, and this just give you an overview. The kids came to pick up kits, they were free and they were donated by some of the organizations. And every day that they got on, they had an activity to do in the professional work with a teacher, because they're not teachers, <laughs> so we need we needed each other to come up with this. And they had people from Washington, uh, South Africa. Bryson, you want to say anything about it? And so here is one of our school-wide PBLs, flatten the curve. And let me tell you, everything don't get smooth. We made mistakes. We did the first one, <laughs> uh, the uh, tiny house. And what we realized, we really need to get teacher buy-in. So you have to form these committees, and you have to talk about and get the teachers to sort of drive the work, and then talk about how the whole school can play a part. So here are the second grade uh, students um, they wanted to feed the community. So they end up writing, uh, what was it, Memphis Food Banks, and they came and set up in the community to come pick up food. And also towards the end, with the upper grade, we had some of those different organizations come out and judge some of the top ones that we thought, and they emailed their projects through a website that Bryce and I created uh, for teachers to kind of put in the work. So we were going to judge it or show people on the advisory committee, we had the 
documentation. And those who look, trying to do STEM destination, that's a good way to get teachers to send you things that you need those artifacts. And so this is just how we showcase our products and how we try to take it beyond the classrooms. And some of them donated. They were really impressed. The kids got with iPads and gift cards. It was really nice. And here this uh, school year, because you can also work with your local universities to come in. So we work with the University of Memphis STEM Ambassadors. They came in and set up all the STEM fest, and the future leaders of STEM members helped them as well. And the white coat ceremony, my favorite. When I talked to Dr. West, my mentor, I was like, hey, I want us to have a white coat ceremony for our STEM club members. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, how your white coat went? <laughs> ceremony, hang on. So we do this every year. And so it's just like the model of a medical college ceremony. They say uh, the oath, they get pinned, pinned and coated by a black STEM professional, STEM professional that look like them. And now we're up to about, oh my God, it's a lot of mentors that join us now, 25 to 50. It's like, it's a ripple effect. It's more and more common. And you can go to YouTube to actually see the white coat. I can't show it, but it's on, uh, let me say, John P. Freeman White Coat Ceremony. And every month they meet with STEM professionals. And it's diverse, we have, but we do try to cater toward who they are as individuals. And that's my former student, one of my babies. She did, uh, helped them train and get certified for CPR. Here's Dr. Ben. She was my mother, doctor, her medical oncologist, and it was very hard. And that's Dr. West, my mentor. And here are some of our STEM partners that we have at John P. Freeman. So, to finish up, so what do you want your school culture to look like? Anybody want to share? So just something to think about. So call to action. When you go back to your school, what is your next step? And some of you online, <laughs> what is your next step? Any questions? Okay. Um, I try to look what's in the community. And if it's somebody that knows a person that's interested in seeing, we work with them, like Geotech is in the neighborhood, so we invited them in and give them a presentation so they can see our STEM uh, culture, and we ask them to join us. So we do that, and so when you go out to different places, like when I visit museums, I ask them how can they connect with the school, what they can do. I call the local universities, letting them know, and letting them know my, uh, our struggles as a school. Like we want to teach robotics, and we need some help with the Spiros or uh, we need help with competing with E-Day. So it's just amazing how all you have to do is just share your story. It doesn't take long, <laughs> and you'll be surprised how uh, quickly they want to support you. Thank you. Anybody else? I tell them don't give up. I tell them you can do it. I let them know that I struggle <laughs> with uh, some things. And sometimes I do the experiment with them. And sometimes it doesn't turn out the way <laughs> that I want it to turn out. And I tell them, you know, this is how we have to do is kind of 
reconnect and do it again. And sometimes you can just do those maker space and just give them something to do so they'll be comfortable with exploring. But don't give up. Keep doing it because eventually they'll be just like Braylon because at first he was getting frustrated. But he started seeing other, te uh, other students accomplish the goal as well. Well, I would love to stay in touch with you guys. And here's my, you can follow me on Twitter. And here's my email address. Thank you so much.